Law. Rage Against the Machine. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. At 8 a.m. in Honolulu, the day was just starting at the biggest Xerox corporate headquarters in Hawaii. Nobody realized that in a matter of minutes, this ordinary morning would begin the worst mass shooting in Hawaiian history. Today, we're talking about the 1999 Honolulu shootings, also known as the Xerox murders. Born in 1959, Byron Osugi lived in the Nuanu neighborhood of Honolulu. While in high school, Oisugi became a member of his high school's rifle team, its Army JROTC chapter. Classmates called him a quiet student who was never much trouble. In 1997, Oisugi crashed his father's car while driving home from a graduation party. Hitting his head on the windshield, Oisugi suffered a head injury from an accident and, according to his brother Dennis, was never the same. But life went on. Oisugi lived a fairly normal life in the years after his injury. In 1984, he becomes a Xerox technician, a steady job that afforded him the stability of his life, his family. It was a good fit for his active, inquisitive mind. Oisugi gets married and in 1996 has a daughter. According to friends, Oisugi was fiery and withdrawn with a rich inner life and had lots of hobbies. The two biggest hobbies of his might surprise you, or not. Oisugi loved collecting and breeding rare goldfish and koi, which he would sell to local pet stores. His other hobby was guns lots of guns. In 1999, Oisugi had 25 guns registered in his name dating back to 1982, and later police would recover 11 handguns, 5 rifles, and 2 shotguns of Oisugi from his father's residence. But let's jump back a little bit. According to testimony from Oisugi's father, Hiroyuki, Oisugi was normal until he started working as a service technician for Xerox in 1984. That wasn't a good fit, according to his father. Then when Hiroyuki's wife, Oisugi's mother, died in 1988, Oisugi started to complain about a poking sensation in his head. Did he get that checked out? I doubt it. Or maybe no one thought it was a cause for concern or alarm. At Xerox, everyone works in these little work groups, teams of people who work together to fix machines, solve problems, etc. Oisugi was in one group that was apparently going okay, but was transferred to another around the time of his mother's death. He clashed a ton with his new work group, accusing them of harassing him and tampering with the machines he would use. It was alleged that the work group also left Oisugi out of activities and conversations, maybe rightfully so, which added to his feelings of anger and isolation, which of course snowballed. Coworkers said that as early as 1995, Oisugi was openly speaking of carrying out a mass shooting at the workplace, were he ever to be fired. But it wasn't just at work that Oisugi was feeling ostracized and attacked. His paranoia was growing at home. He started hearing voices in his head and claimed he was being followed by a mysterious black shadow. Oisugi alleged that there was a conspiracy against him and that his home was bugged with listening devices. In 1993, Oisugi told his brother that a shadow pinned him down. To address this growing paranoia, supernatural paranoia, maybe not the sociological, the family had their house blessed by a Shingon priest in 1997, hoping to help ease Oisugi's mind. But even the minister suspected Oisugi had a mental illness good on that priest. Later that year, Oisugi's father suggested that he see a psychiatrist, but he did not. Oisugi's anger was growing exponentially, and he eventually made public death threats against his co-workers. In 1993, after he kicked an elevator door and threatened his supervisor, Oisugi underwent psychiatric evaluation and anger management coursework. Soon, Xerox replaced a photocopier Oisugi frequently repaired, and he began resisting training and knowledge of the new model. His resistance of learning this new copier became a huge deal in the office and with Oisugi's superiors. On November 1st, 1999, Oisugi's manager forced him to undertake the training to understand and manage the new copier. In his interview with forensic psychiatrist Michael Wellner, Oisugi reasoned that because he would refuse to undertake the training, management would then fire him. As he told Dr. Wellner, I decided to give them a reason to fire me. On that note, let's take a break. Hi, hello, how are you? Hello. This is the check-in. This is the time when we check in on you. This is it. Hmm. How's it looking? Uh. Oof. Don't actually don't answer that. Don't yeah, answer that. Yeah, yeah. Don't answer that. 
Say it to yourself silently. Yeah, very silently. Yes. That's right. We want to say hello to anyone who's listening, anyone who shares and supports the podcast, all of our patrons. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to our government. That's right. That's the machine we do not rage against. No, 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 no. We we, uh, exalt them and we respect them. And we're quiet around them when they're trying to sleep. Introducing the mayors. David Bull. Hello. Ashley Matson. Hello. Dara Rosenzweig. Hello. James Harrington. Hello. And the governor. The governor. Who could be corrupt but chooses not to. But we don't care. Chooses virtue. We, we would love take her. It. Yeah. <laughs> Avian Noble. Noble. So if you want early access, bonus episodes, no chit chat. No. Patreon.com slash ghost town pod. That's right. That moves us right into Apple Podcast Review. Let's get right to it. If you left one, thank you. <laughs> if you haven't and want to, please do. Mm-hmm. And if you do, you could write something like this. I like it. Could be better. Three stars. <laughs> I'll take that review. I'll take it. This is Raw Dancer 24 in the US and A. I like the stories, but have two issues that keep me from loving it. Hmm. Just two? Just two. <laughs> <laughs> Again, these are I, all wins. I have 11 personally. <laughs> all right. The commercial and banter breaks, all in one breaks the flow. Wow. Maybe do the banter at the beginning? <laughs> I don't mind it. It's just doubled with long commercials, and I forget where we're at by then. That's number one. Wow. Wow. Number two. <laughs> Rebecca talks way too fast Uh-oh. for us to really absorb the tale. Maybe a little more dynamics to the voice wouldn't hurt, too. It can seem monotone at times. Other than that, I think it's a good podcast and topics. <laughs> That's great. You're not the first person to say that my voice has bored them. <laughs> Believe me. You know, I read this and I usually am like, okay, you know, your opinion is your opinion and mm-hmm. it's very, very valid. <laughs> as far as the banter in the beginning, that was the issue before. Then yeah. we moved to the middle. <laughs> you got to understand, like, everyone has a preference where they want it or what's best for them. Mm-hmm. The reason it's in the middle, if you know your ghost town history. Oh, do you? Does anyone care? We used to do it in the beginning. Yes, a lot of it. And I loved it. I'll say it. If we did this whole thing and it was all banter, I'd be very happy. But people didn't like it. And it wasn't uh, a pleasant experience for you to listen to. So we stopped doing that. If you think Rebecca talks fast now or (laughs) I talk fast now, go listen to some of those early episodes I did. Don't. Please don't. Not fun. Forgive Very me. Very fast. Forgive me. And I've gotten better. I feel like from doing this for how many years? Four years we've been doing this. And from other work that I've done, I've tried to slow down to make you not hate me. Did it work? When I edit these, I, I listen to all these. I listen to many, many hours of Ghost Town when we're done recording Ugh. and i you know notice the sound waves and and you know all the things that come in audio editing and your voice is actually ext- it, i'm gonna say i'll speak for the episode itself are very consistent throughout the whole thing in the banter stuff it all everything fluctuates because sure. we're just riffing man oh yeah you can't stop us we're artists but i feel like it's a consistent and not monotone but also not straying too far mm-hmm. you know yeah, I mean, I again, just speaking from me and who I am and, and just my experience, I feel like I remember rushing through an episode and reading through and kind of slogging through and hoping that, you know, it was enjoyable or, or feeling like I'm judging myself a lot. I'm saying from already from a place of self-deprecation and kind of hating my voice to like, I've definitely gotten better. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not one to hand out compliments ever. <laughs> ever. But I will I'll go to bat for Rebecca on this one that it much improved on both of our ends and Yes. I would say it's not monotone based on sound waves that I'm looking at because if it were monotone <laughs> it would be like a flat thing but We're no, entertaining. It it's just science. Now if you want monotone, <laughs> there's a new promo for History's Greatest Mysteries Season 3 <laughs> that I'm in. You can find it probably on the website, but also my Instagram, which mm-hmm. is the Jason Horton, or the Ghost Town when I put it on there, too, because yeah. mm, Ghost Town Pod, check it out. The episode that I'm in, or it might be more than one, I don't know how they split it up. Mm-hmm. We'll, the show starts end of February, and it will be somewhere in March, and hopefully 
the ghost town mentions are in there because it's probably why I did it. To yeah, get the word absolutely. Out about ghost town. Absolutely. Because uh, more news. So what I do when I'm not doing ghost town is I've been working on a, a bunch of different shows and, and we'll talk about them as they come to fruition and, and, and they're available to the public. I have been working on a, a game show essentially called Brain Games and Brain Games on the Road, a lot of different incarnations. And the newest uh, season is, will be on Nat Geo on February 25th. So f- end of February is a big, it's a big end of the month for us. Yeah, they should know that they don't need to listen to the past s- or watch the past six, seven seasons. To no, know what's going that's on right. Here. That's right. You know, it's a it's a traveling game show. We made we made it during COVID. We made it in 2020. It was a lot of work, but if, yeah, if you want to know what I do outside of this podcast, it is essentially design and create and write games for this show and a lot of the aesthetics too i had a part in you may even hear my voice in some of them um it's very fast though so you might <laughs> it's listen. gonna be very fast you're not gonna like it but yeah if you have kids it's good for kids i don't know <laughs> what the crossover is with ghost town listeners and parents but it might be fun to check out and if you want to know what i do outside of ghost town <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> sure, get, get back, back to, to it. Honolulu. So we are back in downtown Honolulu shortly after 8 a.m. on November 2nd, 1999. I'm going to take a breath, kind of change gears here. Byron Osugi goes to Xerox, bringing a loaded 9mm semi-automatic pistol and two extra magazines of ammunition with him. When he enters the building, he briefly chats with an employee on the first floor, no big deal, very cordial, and then calmly goes to the office's second floor, where he takes out his gun, shoots and kills employees Ron Kawame and Jason Baltico in a tech office. But Randall Shin, another co-worker in the office, is spared inexplicably. Oisugi then entered a conference room where a team meeting was taking place, and after allegedly waving goodbye to everyone in the meeting, shoots and kills all five Xerox employees present, including his supervisor, the one who made him learn the new photocopier the day before. After trying to kill another co-worker in the stairwell, Oisugi takes a company van and drives away. When he leaves, Jason Balatico, 33, Ford Kanahira, 41, Ronald Katoka, 50, Ronald Kawame, 54, Melvin Lee, 58, Peter Mark, 46, John Sakamoto, 36, were killed. Were all killed, with co-worker Steve Matsuda narrowly escaping with his life. Aside from Matsuda, most of these individuals were shot multiple times, with five bullets being found in at least one of the victims. So Byron Oisugi tears away in a company van after this horrific, horrific tragedy and is MIA for about two hours. Then around 9.45 a.m., Oisugi is spotted sitting in a van by a passing jogger in the upscale Makiki Heights neighborhood next to the Hawaii Nature Center, smoking cigarettes and reading magazines just hanging out in the Xerox van. The jogger notifies the police who arrive quickly, cordoned a half-mile-wide area around the van to prevent any civilian casualties from a possible shootout, and the standoff begins. Adding more tension to all of this was, at the time that Oisugi was found, the Hawaii Nature Center was hosting 35 local school children who were trapped inside the center without food and water. Oisugi's brother, Dennis, was eventually called by the police to help authorities talk his brother down. After five hours, his brother actually does de-escalate the situation, and at 3 p.m., Oisugi surrenders. 40-year-old Byron Oisugi was charged with one count of murder in the first degree, seven counts of murder in the second degree, and one count of attempted murder in the second degree. Prior to the close of the trial, counts two through eight were merged into count one. Oisugi's month-long trial began on May 15, 2000, and he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming that he felt like an outcast at work and that he feared his colleagues were conspiring to have him fired. But the prosecution said that Oisugi was deliberate in what he did. Quote, November 2nd was his opportunity, said former Honolulu mayor Peter Carlisle, who was also a prosecutor in the trial. He'd been thinking about killing these people for years and years, and the problem, one of the problems he confronted, was basically they're never in the same location at the same time. That morning, everyone that he wanted to kill was going to be in the same room. Dr. Park Dietz and Dr. Daryl Matthews testified for the defense that he was insane, citing delusions, paranoia, shadowy figures following him, even how he felt his co-workers were tampering with his prized koi fish. 
On June 13, 2000, the jury rejected the insanity defense, finding Oisugi guilty on count one for the seven murders and count nine for the attempted murder, and sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole for count one and life with the possibility of parole for count nine. With the sentences to run consecutively, as note, Hawaii does not have the death penalty, the court also ordered Oisugi to pay $500 in restitution and $70,000 to the Crime Victim Compensation Fund. Later, the parole board reordered Oisugi to serve a minimum term of 235 years in prison, the longest sentence ever recorded for a Hawaiian inmate. Oisugi appealed, but in 2002, the state of Hawaii Supreme Court upheld Oisugi's conviction. In 2004, he considered fighting his conviction based on Rule 40, inadequate representation by his lawyers in his first trial, but decided to not do that. In 2005, Xerox and the hospital that examined Oisugi settled a civil lawsuit brought on by the families of the shooting victims, believing both parties failed to take preventative action based on clear signs of Oisugi's mental instability. As of October 10, 2017, Byron Oisugi is incarcerated at the Saguaro Correction Center in Arizona. The case made Hawaii pass a law that requires doctors to reveal information about the mental state of persons applying to buy guns. Great law, in my humble opinion. And then, to conclude, in another strange turn of events. Xerox left their corporate office at 1200 North Nimitz Highway after the shooting, or understandably, and it stood vacant until 2004, when the producers of the TV show Lost built a soundstage there to film indoor scenes. Currently, the property is a natural stone and tile showroom. I imagine if you're someone like me with a morbid curiosity, you're going to want to find those lost episodes to, mm-hmm. or find out what episodes they film there, mm-hmm. what in- interiors that uses it as a set in there. It's uh, not not to say that people have filmed in many, many places that things have happened, but this is a very specific yeah. thing for a very specific show. Mm-hmm. And I, I just wonder what it was like to be like, oh, hey, P.S., you know, what happened here? Like a historic thing in, in Hawaii's history. Yeah, absolutely. It must have been uh, very interesting. But it also makes sense to me because I know about Lost and I was a fan of the show when it was on until the last season. But they, they shot all over Hawaii, especially around Honolulu. And, you know, to find an office space that looks like it was from, let's say, the mid 90s must have been you know, probably hard to get a whole crew in there. You need enough space. You need it within the budget. The idea of, you know, this vacant Xerox office probably worked within their budget. They probably would be happy to have anyone use the space considering its history and to give it a new, kind of a new life is is pretty interesting to me. I've never seen Lost. Can you explain the whole thing to me right now? <sighs> Family. It looks a little different for everyone. For some, it's mom and dad. For others, roommates who feel like family. And for others, it's your significant other, their golfing buddies, your children, a high school soccer team starting lineup, and oh look, they're all taking you up on the offer to stay for dinner, really testing the limits of that phrase, the more the merrier. But no matter where you call home, GEICO makes it easy to bundle and save on home and car insurance. Easier than making three frozen pizzas and assorted frozen veggies into a cohesive meal. 